Hi. So I'm here to talk to all of you about metrics and instrumentation of code. Uh, the idea is figuring out what it is that your code is actually doing. Uh, so a little bit of background. I'm James Burkhart. I work for Rackspace, specifically on their cloud monitoring team. Uh, metrics are incredibly important to us there. Uh, and you can find me on GitHub as 4K. So why, why do you want to instrument your code? Well, why, why do we even write code in the first place? Uh, to create some sort of value that users will appreciate. Well, what, what form does this take? Providing better solutions than existing solutions and increasing the happiness of users. Why do we do all of these things? More users and users paying us more money. Um, why measure the code performance? to provide even more value, uh, which is the entire reason why we're writing the code in the first place. Better solutions, more users, increased happiness, more money. Uh, well, how much better? How much more? How, how much increase? These are the questions that you need instrumentation to be able to accurately answer. Um, so there's really two different types of metrics that are sort of interpreted in two different ways, sort of. Uh, there's key performance indicators or KPIs. These are things like you know, how many users you have, how much money you're making, what your market share is, and then there's the service level or application level performance metrics. These are things like how long it takes for your site to load, uh, cache miss, hit miss ratios, uh, query times, things like that. Uh, you can generally get most of both types from direct code instrumentation. However, there are some things like, for example, market share that are better uh, you know, gathered through other sources. Um, but these things are, are very closely related, actually, in a lot of cases. For example, in 2008, uh, a little bit of background, in 2008, the average load time, top 100 sites on the internet, three and a half seconds, seems barbaric by today's standards. Um, Amazon found in that year that increasing the site render time uh, or load time as a whole by 100 milliseconds, 1% increase in revenue, uh, directly related. Google, same year, found that going from 400 milliseconds to 900 milliseconds page load time, 20% decrease in revenue. Uh, these things are very closely related. If you don't measure it, you can't track it. You can't find the relationships between the numbers, and you can't accurately understand what the numbers even are. Uh, so I want to share a quote from Paul Graham, who was one of the founders of the Y Combinator Startup Accelerator. Um, the context for the quote, the rest of it, is that merely measuring something has an uncanny tendency to improve it. If you want to make your user numbers go up, put a big piece of paper on the wall and every day plot the number of users. You'll be delighted when it goes up and disappointed when it goes down. Pretty soon, you'll start noticing what makes the number go up, and you'll start to do more of that. Corollary, be careful what you measure. So quick review, why do we write the code? To create value. Why do we measure it? To provide more value. Uh, measuring the code performance also lets us diagnose and resolve problems. Uh, what's the definition of a problem? Anything that will negatively impact user value. Um, code does weird things. It does a lot of things that we don't expect it to do. Code that is sitting up, you know, in your IDE or Vim or whatever your editor of choice is, is not the same as code that's running. Um, code that's running on your local dev, uh, dev environment and its performance characteristics are radically different from code executed in production. Um, you can't expect to measure local execution of code and expect the performance characteristics to be the same uh, when you are running it in production. So let's, let's talk about a problem. So you've got your, this disgruntled customer tweeting at you, why is your API so slow? Well, you know, this is really a lot of problems. You need to know when the problem started, is this something new? Uh, what else is related? How many users are affected? What's going on here? Or, or even if you're responsible for the issue, I mean, is their ISP just really slow today? Uh, you really don't know. And without instrumentation, who knows? <laughs>
So proactive, better than reactive. You should not have to rely on your users to tell you that your service is broken. Uh, you should know before or at the same time, in worst case, uh, as the first user to know that something is wrong. So hopefully by now I've convinced all of you that you should be instrumenting your code. Well, where do you start? Uh, what do you want to instrument? One approach, everything. Specifically, uh, API calls, read writes, scheduled jobs, queue lengths, system level metrics, uh, you know, CPU, RAM, uh, number of open connections, things like that. Um, what do you not instrument? Anything that will not actually change your future behavior. The entire reason that you're instrumenting code is so that you will be able to make better decisions using data in the future. If by instrumenting something you will not be able to do that, it's not worth measuring. Uh, so the simplest, most naive approach to instrumentation, you've got this Python-like pseudocode. Gets a website, writes it to a file. God knows why you want to do this, but you want to do it. Uh, and you want to know how long it takes. So easy way to do that would be you just record the time that you start, record the time that you end, and you emit a log line. It says it took how many, this many seconds to get whatever URL and write it to disk. But this approach is really bad because logging is really terrible for most metrics. You really don't want to use logging for most metrics. It's very difficult to figure out what the trend is. Imagine seeing you've got some service emitting hundreds of log lines a second of that type where it says, you know, how, how long it took to get some URL. How do you, how do you figure out over time whether that value is changing, what the value is for one week versus another week, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very difficult to figure that out. So when you do want to use logging, um, like exception stack traces or when you really need to preserve context. For example, when your API server serves the 500, you want to know what it is that the user queried to result in your <coughs> service throwing that 500, uh, that sort of thing. So there are better approaches, uh, open source libraries. I'm going to talk about three today, uh, specifically the metrics library written by Coda Hale, uh, who works at Yammer. Um, the, it, this will run anywhere on the JVM, so you know, for your, it, it is written in Java. Uh, there's also a Ruby port of it, metrics with a K, you can also find that on GitHub. I don't actually have experience with it. Um, StatsD. This is a stats aggregation daemon. Uh, it was originally written, or the protocol was designed at Flickr, um, and eventually Etsy picked it up, wrote a node daemon for it. The server's in about seven languages, there are client libraries in about, whatever that is, 12 and implementing your own client library would be trivial if you are using another language. Um, and Graphite, which is a scalable real-time stats graphing system. Uh, this was created at Orbitz, the travel company, and open source. But no. uh, so the metrics library has five different types of, different types of metrics. Uh, you've got gauges, counters, meters, histograms, timers. I'm going to get into each one of those, starting with gauges. Uh, this is, represents an instantaneous measurement um, and provides exactly one numerical output every flush interval, which is the count. Uh, for example, in this, you are trying to measure how many cache evictions uh, you, you've got in some sort of cache that provides a get evictions count method. Um, all you do is you create a new gauge that provides one method, value, that returns the value. Um, in this case, the number of, ev of evictions in the cache. Um, counters are actually extremely similar to gauges. The only difference is how it is that you interact with them. They both provide a single numerical value at any point in time. Um, or at the, the flush interval, whatever its current value is. Uh, you can increment and you can decrement them. Uh, for example, if, you, if your cache did not have a get evictions count method, you would just modify wherever the eviction occurs and increment the count there. 
and you would have exactly the same output as the previous, uh, as the gauge example. Uh, histograms are where things start to get a little bit more interesting. These measure distribution of values. Um, what you can use this for is number of objects returned by some API call. Let's say it's on you know, some collection, and each user has a different sized collection. For example, uh, you would just create a new histogram, and then you, when you are about to return the collection, you just update it with objects, whatever the collection is, dot size. Uh, so there are three. There are actually three different types of histograms that you can use. Uh, the first of which is a uniform histogram. I don't recommend this. It, is, uh, it uses an algorithm called Vitter's R to provide sort of uh, sampling. And the values that are returned are, are valid for the lifetime of the histogram. Um, usually you don't care about that, though. Usually what you want is to be able to detect changes based on recent values, changes in the stream. Um, so what you would use for that is a biased histogram. Uh, that is representative of roughly the past five minutes of data at any point in time. And it uses what's called the forward decaying priority reservoir, which for is sort of a, a complicated statistics talk for a smaller, it uses sampling. Um, and that sampling is representative of recent data. Um, the third type is a sliding window where you define exactly how long it is that the histogram should be valid for, what the, um, sorry, what, what window of time it should be representative of, which is actually the least efficient because it does not use sampling and it has to store however much time that is worth of data in memory at any point. Um, Uh, also, these so this will generate, unlike the previous two, which only generate a single numeric value of count, this will generate quantiles, uh, which is 75th percentile, 95th, 98th, 99th, and 99.9th. What these are are if you were to put all the numbers in order, you would, for 99th percentile, if you had 100 entries, you would take the 99th largest, and that's what that would be. Um, it also provides min min, max, mean, median, and standard deviation. Meters, these are used for tracking rate of occurrence. Um, use it for how many GET requests your API server is processing. Every time you get a GET request, you just mark the meter. Uh, you could also use it for, you can also mark it with some sort of value that is, um, we'll mark it that many times over. Uh, in, in the second example. Uh, these provide a one minute, five minute, 15 minute rate, and a mean rate. Mean rate is generally not that useful in the same way that a uniform histogram is not useful. It is valid for the lifetime of the meter, uh, whereas the one, five, and 15 minute rate are valid for that many minute of a window uh, into, into the past. Um, when you create one of these, you pass in what the uh, number of events per X is, in this case seconds. I highly recommend you use seconds. I'll get into exactly why later, but it has to do with a graphite function called hit count that will let you then view it in terms of per whatever variable you actually care about at the time of uh, visualization. And timers are probably the most useful metric. And they're also a combination of the two that we discussed already, histogram and meter. Uh, these provide all of the numeric values at every flush interval that each histogram and meter combined uh, would produce. So metrics will report via JMX, HTTP, JSON output, uh, as well as ship that data straight to Graphite, which is what we care most about. Um, the metrics will be aggregated and flushed on some sort of configurable interval. I believe that the default is 60 seconds. It works pretty well. Uh, depending on what your use case is, you may want to uh, do some sort of value between uh, 10 and 60 seconds. 
uh, statsd, effectively, it's a proxy for Graphite. Um, it will. It is a daemon process that will take in uh, take in metrics shipped to it, then perform aggregations on them, and then ship out the aggregations to, in our case, Graphite. Uh, so, at Flickr, they have this problem of wanting to know what the distribution of values in some sort of stream of data was. Um, in this case, in these graphs, each one of these represents a single, uh, let's say, request. And they wanted to know, how do you tell the difference between a server that handles 10% uh, of requests slowly or has periodic slow periods? And their solution to that was to do aggregation. So here, now they're actually generating the quantiles, and you have a pretty clear picture of what the 75th percentile mean, 25th percentile, what the range of time something is expected to take, and how far the uh, largest requests differ from the average requests uh, in terms of processing time. Uh, another problem is in these two data sets, the mean is exactly the same, and yet each one of these higher quantiles uh, is radically different. Uh, these data sets should not be treated identically. Quantiles matter uh, and should be looked at in certain circumstances. So the other problem that they had, how often do you do something across multiple hosts? Let's say you've got some cache server that you want to know how many times any host connects to it and you can't directly instrument that cache server for whatever reason. Um, if you were doing this, this often, incrementing some sort of value in a database would be extremely slow, uh, doing it at this scale. So instead, they wrote statsd. Uh, this takes some UDP packets, which are relatively lightweight, from all, all of the hosts, and then aggregates those values into um, into something that then every every flush interval of stats d is a single value per metric for uh, that's coming in. Uh, actually, sorry, not a single value per metric. The same number of, of values effectively as um, as the metrics library. For example, it would produce quantiles in the same way that the metrics library would produce quantiles. Um, there exactly the same types of metrics that it supports as the, as the metrics library. Uh, graphite, made up of several parts. Uh, carbon, which is the back end. All that graphite will store is numeric time series data. Uh, you can't use it for something like string metrics or log messages. Uh, made up of three parts. The agent takes data in, the cache takes the data from the agent, uh, makes it available to both the web interface and to the persister process, which writes it to disk. Um, the way that it's written to disk is very similar to RRD, if you're familiar, round robin database, uh, which effectively is just a fixed size file with a number of slots, predefined, uh, and as new data comes in, the old data is pushed out. Um, this is the, the reason that they call this real time is that if you were to ship a metric to Graphite, before it's been persisted, it's still available through the web interface via storage in the carbon cache. Uh, the web interface will query both the on-disk whisper files as well as the cache. Uh, Orbits has said that they're pushing 160,000 metrics a minute using two servers, so relatively scalable. Uh, the web interface, pretty simple. Two parts, graphs and dashboards. Dashboards are just a collection of graphs. Um, when you are sending data to Graphite, you have to name each metric. Every metric is defined by some sort of unique name. Uh, each part of the name is a path component. These are delimited by the dot character. 
Uh, Graphite also supports wildcards, and we'll talk to you, talk about exactly how to leverage it. But my recommended naming schema would be what the host name is, metric type, as in gauge, meter, um, counter, etc. What it is that you're measuring, and then the name of the metric. Uh, and my suggested host name schema for leveraging wildcards would be what the data center is, the environment, staging production, uh, what the role of the node is, and whatever that node ID is. Uh, for example, you know, zero through n, where n is number of servers, you know, minus one uh, of that role. So this is a pretty simple example. It's pretty clear what this does for a server in your East One data center, a staging APIs zero node, um, what the percent idle your CPU is on that box. Um, you can also use multiple, you can have as many path components as you want. I, I believe that there's some limit uh, to how long a metric name can be, but it's uh, doesn't, I've never actually reached that limit. Um, in this case, you've got a really verbose Java-like uh, naming schema, and this is just how many connections are created inside of some particular Java process uh, based on a one minute window. So when you are querying a, for a graph in Graphite, you use the name. In this case, this would be number of get requests served by uh, in your East One data center, in your staging environment, um, or yeah, what the, what the time what the average time for a GET request is in this environment on this box. Uh, for, in this case, your public API's account info endpoint. Let's say you wanted to know for each staging API server instead of just for that particular one. Uh, you would just modify, well, the naive approach would be to just list out all seven of your uh, East One staging API servers. But no, we have wildcards. This makes it much easier. Uh, all you have to do is change one character, change that zero to a wildcard, and all of a sudden, this is now representative of all of these. Uh, that will produce a pretty graph that might look something like this. So let's say that you wanted to know for all of your staging API servers, what that average is. Uh, well, Graphite has interesting aggregation functions. For example, in this case, we're using the average series, which takes in a, uh, a series of time series data points, um, i.e. all of your staging API servers average get request time for that endpoint. And takes it at each interval and averages that value and compresses it to a single um, set of time series data. So let's say we wanted to know how many get requests we serve per minute in production across all of the API servers, all of the endpoints, all of the different APIs that we're running. Well, you would use a bunch of wildcards. Uh, wildcard the data center, the node ID, which API service it is, which API endpoint it is, and then you would wrap all of this in a hit count function. This is the one that I was talking about when we were talking about uh, why you want to use per seconds for meters. So what this does is it then tells you per, in this case, minute, what that value is. Hit count expects a value that is representative of uh, occurrences per second and then we'll roll that into how many times per minute uh, in this case. And then you wrap the whole thing in a sum series, which just for each slot in each of those sets of time series data, uh, what the sum is. So we'll get to a complex scenario, but let's, let's start with a simple one. Let's say you've got some code that you want to know how long the, the whole series of events takes, where the series is reading a batch of data, uh, processing each entry, then writing it back 
to some sort of data store. Uh, and you've got a timer around the whole thing that is spiking after a service restart. You want to know exactly where it is that the bottleneck is in this whole set of uh, events, which individual um, step is taking the longest. Well, that's really easy. Three new timers. You wrap the middle timer around the entire for loop. Simple. Well, what if instead of just doing processing every single time, what if there you're interacting with some sort of cache that you aren't actually able to directly instrument, and when it misses, it takes much longer. Um, and then conditionally, based on some other condition, maybe you have to do even more processing of data um, on each one of these. But you don't, you aren't actually able to figure out um, because you're working with some sort of external service for this what the um, whether or not that conditional is fulfilled and directly instrument that. So finding the bottleneck here is a little bit more complicated, but you would start with five new timers, one around each step, and then you want to figure out what the, what the rate of occurrence of this is relative to this for each one of these. Um, Graphite makes that pretty easy using the divide series function. You would just take the, the rate of occurrence for the inner timer um, divided by the uh, rate of occurrence for the outer timer. Um, and then you have the uh, relative rate of occurrence. So then you want to figure out what the overall time spent by this per time that you are running through the entire series of events is. So you then you just multiply that. the relative rate of occurrence times the average time that it takes when it does occur. Um, and then you put everything together into one graph. Um, I guess it's cutting off here, but the outer one is mean time. And then you do the same thing for all three of the inner ones. Uh, although, I guess here you actually don't have to do all the extra work. You can just use the, um, you can just multiply the inner's mean time times the outer's rate of occurrence. Uh, you don't have to figure out relative rate of occurrence. Uh, and then here at the end, you again just use the mean time of the final one. Uh, all of this on a graph would then show you exactly where, exactly how much time per time through the whole series, how much time was being spent on each individual step. So um, a few quick tips for graphite. Always send meters as times per second because of hit count. Hit count lets you roll that to visualize it however you want at the point of visualization, as in per day, per minute, per hour. Um, another thing, services do really weird things when you restart them. You want to track this. Um, you can emit restart events as, as a metric. Use a gauge. If the service just restarted, emit a 1. Otherwise, emit a 0. Um, I actually, in the slides, which I will post to the uh, notes section on the, on the website. Um, I include a link to a gist for a restart gauge that you can use directly with the metrics library that I wrote. Um, when you add this to a graph, use draw as infinite. That will then just scale whatever the value is. If it's non-zero, it will draw a straight line. Uh, this graph, without the blue lines, makes a lot less sense. The blue lines representing service restarts than this graph with the blue lines. Um, you clearly understand that the spike is probably a result of the restart uh, in, in this graph. So you've got either some sort of code running on the JVM, in which case I recommend using that metrics library by Coda Hale, um, which ships to Graphite directly. Or you have some other language, in which case you would just use a statsd client implemented in that language, which would ship to statsd, 
the aggregations occur there, and then the aggregated values get shipped on to Graphite. All right, so what do, you, what do you do with all this data? You want to know when things break? You want to know how many API requests we handle and how many that you can handle. Uh, you want to know where your bottlenecks are, whether you have enough uh, CPU to support doubling in uh, throughput uh, for some sort of worker process that takes something off of the queue and does some work. Uh, when you change code, you want to know whether you fixed whatever I issue it is that you made the change to fix, or whether you just actually worsened the problem. And you want to know very quickly. So <laughs> that's it. Um, so any questions? You put this line when you have a um, yes, I will put them on the, the open source bridge. I think that there's some wiki associated with each talk. Um, yeah, session notes, yes. Yes, I will post the slides to the session notes. Also, if you go to tinyurl.com slash metrics45, um, you can get them if you're impatient. Uh, I guess a couple of things. I, I'm a little confused about the headcount function. Is okay. that just so Graphite can scale it across different time? So with meters, um, you're shipping every, let's say, 60 seconds, you're, you're shipping a value to Graphite. Yeah. And that value is representative of how many, let's say, API requests you've served per second for the past 60 seconds. Um, and if you wanted to know, instead of how many API requests am I serving per second, you want to know how many am I serving per hour, you just wrap the whatever that metric name is in hit count, passing the second argument as one hour, and then that value is multiplied by you know sixty times sixty for each spot, basically. You can just multiply that rate directly by thirty six. You could. I mean you, you could do that. Um, hit count just makes it sort of easy and more human readable. Um, uh, another thing um, with the meters, histograms thing the moving averages, I was a little confused on. I use metrics, and it said it, the exponential decay of these is like uh, the Unix uptime command or something, but I, uh, I guess I wasn't clear on how um, that happened with the 15, 5, and 1 minute rates or something. There. So I know with the, with the meters, um, those will keep a, it uses, I'm not sure exactly on the technical details of it, but I know that the, what it is that they claim to be is representative of that many minutes into the past. Um, so, and I know that it uses sampling for those those time windows, um, but I don't know exactly what, um, other than that they are representative of that long into the past. Um, just some numbers I've seen from that, like, didn't make a lot of sense to me. I was just wondering, if, I don't know, maybe it just gives a spike and then drop off and then jump back up or something. <laughs> Yeah, I know that the, like, for example, 15 minute rates will be a lot less spiky than the one minute rates um, from, from what I've seen. Also, uh, looking at the code, it's a little bit uh, complicated and mathy, but it's pretty short um, and somewhat readable. Uh, just a general note uh, with the graphite stuff, um, mm. if you start using it, when it rolls it up, it uses average by default. Um, so it's, you can actually set it to maximum. Right. Otherwise, data will disappear, and like you'll see really high data points on your lower intervals, and the average will disappear. Yes, so that is. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a good um, a good point. I should add it to the slides. Yeah. Uh, do you just use the Graphite dashboard for all viewing all your graphs? I mean, there's a million dashboards out there, and I um, most. We, we do. So I've tried gira Giraffe, I think, is the one that I tried. And I found it to be very difficult to work with. Yeah. Um, I think that one of those might be useful for the more useful for like the predefined dashboards. But I know that in 
graphite trunk, um, a lot of the, the problems that I have with graphite where it is that like I want to edit an entire dashboard at once and just use like copy paste into into Vim, then you know edit a bunch of lines simultaneously. Uh, you can actually do import export of dashboards in a JSON format, um, which will make my life a lot easier when we start using that. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys.